This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Tableau Software and Dole Food Company. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us over the Internet from locations around the world today. Thank you for your service and for being with us again. In just a moment, the co-founder and CEO of Aeromobile, Mr. Yuri Vakulik will be joining us to talk about the world's most advanced flying car, which you can see take off, fly, and land on our website at RebeccaCosta.com. I want to encourage all of our listeners to have a look at the video because once you see a flying car driving along the freeway with other cars and then pull off the road and take flight, well, there'll be no question in your mind that the technology not only works, but is teed up for mass production. So move over Tesla and Google self-driving cars. Why sit in traffic when you can pull over, stretch your wings, and fly over it? Buckle up your seatbelts. We have an exciting hour ahead of us. But before Mr. Vakulik joins us to talk about the future of transportation, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Juraj Vakulik is from Slovakia, a country with a population of roughly 6 million people and which maintains one of the strictest immigration policies in all of Europe, resulting in many more Slovakians living and working in Slovakia than foreigners. Vakulik studied at VSMU's Academy for Performing Arts during what has been called the Velvet Revolution, which brought an end to communism in Slovakia. His first stop after graduating was to work as a theater director for some of the most prestigious Slovakian theaters. And this was followed by starting a successful advertising agency from the ground up in 1996, an agency whose reach quickly extended to 30 countries. His clients included T-Mobile, IKEA, Panasonic, Dell, and Mercedes-Benz, to name a few. And the agency was the proud recipient of over 200 major awards. But Vakulik was just getting warmed up. In 2010, he took on an even bigger challenge, co-founding Aeromobile for the purpose of developing the first commercially viable flying car. And today we're going to learn about just how fast that car is coming to a road near you. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report co-founder and CEO of Aeromobile, Mr. Yuri Vakulik. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Vakulik. Good morning. Uh, I'm very happy, uh, and thanks for inviting me. Now, as I understand it, the work on the initial prototype started 25 years ago. Stefan Klein, Aeromobile's chief designer and his father, started experimenting in a garage. So tell us about how the idea began and how you came to join the company. Exactly as you said, uh, it's not uh, a new product, a uh, new project. It started 25 years ago, and I have to uh, uh, put you into the historical reality of the times. Uh, at the times we were living in a former communist bloc, and all of us were dreaming how to escape to, to the free world and how to be able to uh, travel without the limits, without the borders, without the police on the borders. And uh, my partner and co-founder, Stefan Klein, uh, started to dream about uh, the flying car as a solution, how to escape from the former communist bloc. And uh, then the Velvet Revolution came. I take a part as a student leader. So it uh, changed uh, our uh, reality. But on the other hand, we are still stuck in the traffic jams and still a lot of limits are in front of us. So. Uh, Stefan keep this idea as his private hobby project and next to his official career as a very respected professor of transportation design uh, who teach a lot of uh, now world-class automotive designers. He still kept this uh, project in his own garage. And then uh, as we knew each other from those years, he visited me at the beginning of 2010 and we start to chat about this project and then uh, we decided okay let's do it in real and let's, let's to move this hobby private project into the real professional life so we founded the company and we start uh, to work on our mobile as a really very serious uh, way have to 
change the transportation on a global scale. So just to go back in time, you and Stefan had this dream when you were students under a communist regime. And until the Velvet Revolution occurred in Slovakia, there really wasn't any mechanism for you to be able to form a company and a valid commercial venture, so to speak. No, no, all these things was forbidden uh, by the government. So both uh, uh, possibility to be the private entrepreneur and also the possibility to, to travel free uh, was created only after the Velvet Revolution. So before, it was simply not possible. This is an interesting story because you had to help bring about the revolution before you could bring about the company, before you could bring about the flying car. Yes, so as you see, everything has its own logic, and uh, these steps in my life somehow lead me uh, to this company and uh, uh, gives us, uh, both Stefan and me, an opportunity to build uh, the flying car. So uh, now we are doing uh, and we are trying to create a new revolution, uh, these days, revolution in person transportation. It, that's a very good way of putting it. We've gone now from a, a democratic revolution to a technological revolution. Exactly. For listeners who have some knowledge of cars or planes, uh, building a flying car is, is very tricky because planes need lift and cars need downforce. And, and for a while, uh, as I understand it, Klein tried integrating the two, but then he changed his approach and decided it was much more efficient to switch from one mode to another. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, uh, this project, it's uh, not so easy. Uh, we are not the first team uh, trying to build a flying car. The first one uh, takes place in the U.S. in uh, 1917, and uh, during uh, all this history, a lot of uh, teams uh, was trying to build a flying car. And exactly as you said, uh, to combine uh, the plane and the car, it's uh, very uh, difficult uh, how to combine the different specification and needs uh, for plane and for the car. So first uh, prototype, automobile uh, generation one, uh, was non-transformable. Uh, it was one object uh, which fits on one hand into the standard parking place, but uh, was able to uh, fly. But uh, it was a handicapped plane and a handicapped car. And then uh, Stefan started to work and uh, he created uh, first sketches for next generation, automobile second generation. Uh, and this was uh, built as a transformation uh, solution when a uh, car was able to uh, change uh, the structure uh, to to, cre uh, to have a wings and uh, to be the small plane. Still, it was very limited solution. Uh, after this uh, trial, we joined forces, we established uh, the company, and we built the first uh, fully functional prototype, uh, pre-prototype Aramobile 2.5 when we uh, try to find uh, the uh, absolutely working solution, both technological and design, which will give us uh, an opportunity to have the fully functional small car and fully functional small plane. And uh, as you, exactly as you said, uh, we uh, were in a situation uh, when we have to find a lot of uh, very uh, crucial solutions uh, like, for example, uh, how to create a lift with the wings, but at the same time, how to fold these wings uh, in a way that it will create enough downforce to have a very stable car. Uh, so we achieved this goal through the pre-prototype 2.5. Uh, currently, we just uh, testing uh, the next generation, Armobile 3.0, and still, it's a long way in front of us. Uh, we are realizing a lot of things uh, on that journey, which uh, then we will use all these information uh, in the next prototypes. Mm -hmm. Now, the first patent for flying a car was filed in 1903, which is pretty surprising. And uh, since that time, there have been many other attempts made to develop a flying car. What, what's made your approach more successful? It's a very long journey uh, to the real flying car. Uh, the crucial, uh, crucial problem is uh, how, how to combine uh, the structure uh, of the car, which, of course, it's four wheels. Uh, it needs uh, to be enough wide uh, to be stable on the road uh, and how to transform the car into the plane. When we come back, we're going to find out just how fast and how far the flying car can travel. Stay tuned. You're listening to the Costa Report. 
I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Dole has a bounty of berries ripe for the picking. Fresh berries are not only delicious, but some of the most powerful disease-fighting foods available. Researchers have found that berries have some of the highest antioxidant levels of any fresh fruits. So add a handful or two of your favorite berries to your next meal and enjoy their nutritional benefits and natural sweetness in all of your dishes, from salads to desserts and everything in between. For fresh tips and ideas from Dole's berry experts, visit berries.dole.com. And be sure to check out the pages of mouth-watering recipes. Whether it's a sweet and savory blueberry cranberry chicken salad or a simple strawberry sorbet, Dole has the perfect berry to inspire your next berrylicious dish. If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and and drag drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. That's Tableau.com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? They say you'll never get a second chance to make a good first impression. Hello, I'm Lisa Sabini from Floors Etc. in Soquel. Floors Etc. will help you make a good first impression at your home or business with our incredible selection of carpet, vinyl, hardwood, linoleum, and window coverings. Listen. Hi, I'm Jack Crawford with Music Now DJs. My job is to provide music and entertainment for weddings, corporate, and special events. I'm a professional, so when it comes to my floors, I've been calling on the professionals at Floors Etc. for over 15 years. They're reliable, they're efficient, and their prices are always reasonable. Floors Etc. will help you make a good first impression at your home or business with our incredible selection of carpet, vinyl, hardwood, linoleum, and window coverings. Stop by Floors Etc.'s beautiful showroom and get to know us. When you need to make a good first impression, start at Floors Etc. 3155 Porter Street, SoCal, 4625586. The rat at our house was captured and killed, not by the dog, but by a damn good rat trap. Nothing like an old-fashioned rat trap to get the job done. Nope. And there's a rat in the breezeway, and I didn't say it quite that. He looked at me, and he said, and how would you like me to take care of that, dear? I went, anyway, you see fit, whatever works for you, that's just fine. <laughs> He said, did you want me to shoot it? John heard it go off uh, early yesterday morning and the the force turned the trap upside down on top of the rat. So it got it right away. And anyway, not only that, it was a good piece of cheese. I mean, it was... Only you would put out brie for a rat in the house. Yeah, no, this was a a 16-year-old aged vintage white cheddar. You are ridiculous. That is absurd. (laughs) Don't miss Good Morning Monterey Bay weekdays, 6 to 9 a.m. on KSEO AM 1080. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is the CEO of Aeromobile, Mr. Uri Vakulik. Uh, For listeners who have not been to my website at RebeccaCosta.com to see footage of the flying car in action, um, as I understand it, you need a space that is roughly the length of an American football field for the vehicle to reach a takeoff speed and uh, get airborne. So let me ask you the first obvious question. Why not have it take off vertically like a helicopter? Okay, it's a very good question. Uh, of course, uh, this looks uh, excellent in the movies, uh, but in real life, uh, 
it will be not uh, so widely used because, first of all, you will be never uh, able to uh, take off uh, vertically in the center of the cities because of the regulation. And even if this will be possible, uh, this will uh, limit your range uh, and a vertical takeoff landing uh, will create uh, anyway so much noise and vibration that this solution will be uh, not uh, such working uh, good solution as the real one when the physics will help you and a lift which we will be able to create with the wings will give us much more efficient flight, much more longer distance in a radius and much safe flight because still if the rotor will not work you will be still able to, to glide enough for the safe landing. So uh, this is our approach and we believe that the combination of the plane and the car is the right one with the wings. Mm-hmm. And, and how about fuel efficiency of the vehicle when it's in car mode and also when it's in plane mode? Uh, of course, uh, we can just comment the current state. We are still in the prototyping phase, so still it's not the final product uh, specification. But even currently, uh, it's pretty impressive uh, with the current engine, uh, which we are using uh, the current prototype. We have uh, fuel consumption in a plane mode of uh, 15 liters, but per hour, which uh, does not mean per uh, 100 kilometers or uh, 100 miles. It's uh, per one flight hour. And uh, on a road uh, mode, uh, it's uh, roughly around uh, 8 liters uh, of the regular mode gas on 100 kilometers. So how, and, far, uh, how far could I go on one tank of gas, let's say, if I were flying? Uh, if you were flying, uh, uh, you can fly over 400 miles uh, with the current prototype and the current engine. Of course, uh, these things uh, we try to improve then to have with the f- final prototype uh, the best possible uh, combination of the fuel efficiency, uh, distance range, uh, and uh, also what's very important for us, uh, that it will be very environmental friendly and uh, the consumption and uh, emissions will be in the best possible way. Now, does the vehicle require any special fuels? I was wondering what happens when you start running out of gas on the road. Do you, have, do you need to find an airport to refuel? No, no, we, we build it uh, that we are using the standard normal gasoline as a, any, any standard car. And, of course, uh, we believe that uh, in the near future we'll be able to have a hybrid system which uh, will work as an electric car and as a uh, combustion engine as a plane. So I can, use, I can pull into a regular gas station and use exactly. regular fuel? Yes, Exactly. So uh, what's the top range for driving and, uh, and, and for flying? I mean, how, how fast can I really go? Again, as I said, uh, all these data uh, are based on a current engine and a current, current prototype. Uh, so well, let's take it, please, as a minimum uh, standards which we uh, have now with the current prototype. So as a car, of course, there are the speed limits uh, which are by regulation, but uh, technically uh, the, the current uh, Current uh, top speed, uh, it's around uh, 100 miles per hour and more. And uh, as a plane, uh, it's uh, 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 124 miles per per hour. But I have to say that it's uh, pretty limited with the current uh, engine because it's not so strong in a ratio between the weight uh, and then the power. Uh, it's, uh, it's not the right one. So now we are currently testing the different engines with the current prototype, and uh, the, the final goal is much higher. So even in car mode, we're talking about 100 miles an hour. Exactly. Wow, that, that's, that's amazing because I, I think there are a lot of pessimists who think that a flying car can only mean one thing, a terrible car and a terrible plane. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when yes. they hear these statistics, they're, they're surprised. Now, of course, uh, it's the uh, it's, uh, right question because, uh, as we discussed in a, in a previous part, uh, to combine the car and the plane is not easy, but we try to build really the sporty car. Uh, we also calling uh, this prototype Flying Roadster, which uh, has to express uh, our vision that it will be a two-seater, sporty, uh, very, uh, very nice to use car, and at the same time, small plane. And we are working really the whole team on to find the best uh, combination of design and functionality to deliver this approach to the market. 
Now, for people who are interested in looking at how luxurious the appointments are uh, inside the vehicle, which are quite surprising, uh, they can, again, go to my website at RebeccaCosta.com and see the video. Now, how about licenses? I assume that in a case like this, you would need both a pilot's and driver's license before you could legally operate the vehicle. You're right, exactly. You need both a uh, driving license for the car mode and a, a private pilot license for the plane mode, but uh, you are not allowed also to legally drive the car on the streets without a driving license, so it's exactly the same in the air. You need the private pilot license, but it will give you so much freedom, so much of excitement and new uh, reality in, in traveling that I'm pretty sure that a lot of uh, our future customers, if th- they don't uh, hold uh, one private pilot license at the moment, they will do that uh, uh, study and they will pass exams uh, to have them. And it's uh, not so difficult. Uh, currently in the U.S. for the basic one, you need just 25 hours of training uh, and, of course, some theory, which is necessary. In, in the European Union, currently, it's 40 hours of training. So 25 to 40 hours of training, pass your pilot's license, and, uh, and, ha- and have a standard driver's license, and it sounds like you're good to go. Yes, I believe. <laughs> um, unless the regulators come in and develop some new regulations, and we'll talk about that uh, in, in, the, in the upcoming segment. Uh, but I would imagine that in order to take flight, you need to be at an airport. You can't just, uh, you know, drive down your street and take flight. Are there certain areas that you're allowed to uh, take flight and land? Sure. Uh, at, uh, at the beginning, we build it that uh, we try to combine existing uh, infrastructure, which means uh, uh, all uh, airports, uh, but not only the big ones. There is plenty, and especially in the United States, uh, small uh, aircraft, sporting one, uh, private airstrips, and all of them uh, could be used for uh, for uh, this kind of aviation. But we do believe that uh, in a really short time, uh, new infrastructure will be created, and uh, it's not so difficult. For example, in European Union, can, uh, currently, you are able to take off uh, from any uh, piece of land if you have a approval from the owner of the land. So well, let's imagine two examples that uh, uh, each resting point next to the highways if it will be equipped with 200 meters or uh, 700 uh, feet long uh, grass strip, is enough for takeoff and landing, or each uh, gas station, uh, petrol station, could be very easily upgraded into the uh, point when you can dra- when, when you can take off and land. Absolutely, you could just add a field to uh, the back of the gas station along the freeway, and there you go. You can land and take off. We have to take another short break. Uh, t- stay where you are. We'll be back with more from the CEO of Aeromobile. You're listening to the Costa Report. Have you checked out the Costa Report blog yet? Well, what are you waiting for? There's no quicker way to find out what newsmakers are saying than the Costa Report blog at RebeccaCosta.com. It's where the former CEO of Apple and PepsiCo, John Scully, predicts where the next tech breakthroughs are going to come from. And also where Trent Lott explains why a GOP reversal of the Senate nuclear option will signal real change in our nation's capital. And the Costa Report blog is where you'll discover why Alan Dershowitz is worried that ISIS is adopting Hamas-like tactics. You'll find all this and more at the Costa Report blog. A new blog is posted every week, and they're short, pithy, and tell the unvarnished truth. Just go to RebeccaCosta.com to get the latest blog. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And while you're there, be sure to register for updates and breaking news. The Costa Report blog, bringing you the news the big networks don't and won't. Did you know that May is National Get Caught Reading Month? Hello, I'm Rebecca Suze from the Friends of the Santa Cruz Public Library. Please join us for our annual spring book sale this Saturday, May 16th from 11 to 4 p.m. at the Downtown Library. We have thousands of novels, children's books, media, and everything in between. Most are only $1 to $3. So join us this Saturday, May 16th, 11 to 4 p.m. at the Downtown Santa Cruz Library parking lot. See you there. Hi, Registered Pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, 
it may change your life. While many hormones are regulated as prescription drugs, there are several important ones that are available over the counter. Progesterone and pregnenolone are two that immediately come to mind. You can get both online and in health food stores and each provide relaxing and estrogen balancing benefits. Another important over the counter hormone is called DHEA. Bodybuilders love DHEA for its muscle building properties. DHEA is also important for supporting the health of the immune system. It can be especially helpful for fighting cancer. In one study on breast cancer prone mice, DHEA supplementation reduced tumor incidence by 50 to 100 percent. And if you're trying to lose weight, DHEA can be helpful for you too. In one study from Temple University, DHEA treated mice tended to stay thin no matter how much they ate. In a second study, middle-aged obese rats lost weight when fed DHEA supplemented food. In fact, if ever there was a hormone with lots of positive health benefits, this is the stuff. Back in the 1980s, the FDA actually banned over-the-counter sales of DHEA. These days, DHEA is readily available and reasonable amounts can be taken with rare side effects and no toxicity. Overdosing on DHEA may lead to some acne or maybe some hair loss, but you've really got to take a lot to experience these effects, which reverse upon dose reduction. With all these benefits, DHEA can be considered the quintessential hormone of wellness. Because natural DHEA levels tend to decline as we get older, supplementing with a small amount, maybe 5 to 10 milligrams a day as father time takes its toll on our bodies, is probably a good idea. Pharmacist Ben here, urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine, it's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to kscohealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool videos, too, at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. You may have heard about the 90 essential nutrients or the mighty 90 needed for good health. But with all the products out there, what exactly are they talking about? The Mighty 90 is 16 vitamins, 12 amino acids, 60 plant-derived minerals, and 2 essential fatty acids, all in the proper ratios to promote good health and vitality. For more information or to order, call Andy or Phyllis Anderson at 888-245-0300. That's 888-245-0300. Back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa. And if you're just joining us, our guest today is the co-founder and CEO of Aeromobile, Mr. Uri Vakulik, who was just explaining that uh, as flying cars become more popular, it'll be easy to add uh, short landing fields and refueling stations in open lands that flank freeways and rural roads. So long as there's a length roughly equivalent to a football field, the new flying plane can take off and land. So uh, tell us a little bit about who the target market is for the flying car and what problem does it solve? Of course, I just want to comment uh, the previous information that, of course, this is the vision. Uh, and we believe that uh, in the future, the new category will be created uh, of the flying cars. Uh, it's like the motorcycles in the past. Uh, it's not a two-wheel car or a bicycle with an engine. It's a unique category. So we believe that in the future, new category will be created. But uh, back to the question, of course, uh, each new technology needs uh, early adopters. We believe that uh, the first product, as we build them, build it, uh, uh, it will be uh, the perfect solution for the current buyers of the uh, supercars and small planes. So it will be a luxury product for very niche market, but it's just the start. We believe that uh, there are three major applications of the flying cars in the future. First, it's urban commuters. Uh, you know, in next 20 years, more cars uh, may be built than in a, a whole uh, over 100 year of the uh, automotive industry, which will uh, push us in a totally new uh, limits uh, with uh, cars all around the uh, big cities. Uh, more and more people are living in the large cities, so this application will be really very, very important. The next one, it's what we are calling medium distance travel. Uh, it's all these trips uh, with the regular uh, airplanes uh, up to 400 miles because each time you need uh, to change a lot of vehicles. Uh, you need to take uh, a cab from your house to the airport, then you spend some time, then finally 
the flight itself is the uh, fastest uh, part of the journey, but again, you will land uh, at some airport and you need to take another vehicle uh, to be able to reach your final destination. So it's not uh, so efficient and uh, uh, these trips uh, will be much more efficient uh, operated uh, with, let's say, the flying cars. Uh, and uh, the last one, and maybe the biggest uh, application, it's all these countries without uh, an infrastructure. By the end of uh, 2030, 8 trillion of US dollars needs to be spent to build missing infrastructure. Uh, because just 3% of the world's surface uh, currently has road infrastructure and just half of that infrastructure is paved. So there is a huge uh, market uh, for this new personal transportation solution. Right. It's either that or build a lot more roads and a lot more airplanes. And as you point out, no matter how fast you get there in a plane, you're slowed down by getting your bags, finding the bus that will take you to the uh, location where you can get your rental car, standing in the line, getting the rental car, yes. dragging your luggage to where the rental car is. It, it's kind of prehistoric. Exactly. You are absolutely right. So we believe that uh, the solution for personal transportation is to lift it from two-dimensional space which is uh, on the ground into the three-dimensional and to combine uh, the existing infrastructure with uh, that one, which is already there and it's the air. And uh, this will be much more efficient. It will be very environmentally friendly and uh, it will create really door-to-door -door transportation when straight from your address, uh, you will be able to reach your final destination. And what's also very important in much more uh, uh, exciting way, as you described just now, waiting in the lines <laughs> for your luggage and for the buses. So uh, we believe that this is the future for personal transportation. Now, I know you don't have a price point right now because you're still in the prototyping stage, um, but how do you keep a, a, a product from becoming exclusively a luxury item, like, like say, the Tesla, for example, right now? Um, uh, you know, if you want to revolutionize transportation and commuting, don't you need widespread adoption to change consumer habits? Absolutely. But uh, as I said, each new innovation, uh, disruptive innovation, needs uh, early adopters which will be able to pay for that, that uh, later on uh, the economic scale uh, could uh, push down the prices and it will be much more uh, adopted by the masses. Uh, so uh, we build our business plan uh, in a way that the first customers will be uh, these uh, buyers of super luxury cars. But uh, we believe that later on, uh, with the economy of scale, it could be much cheaper. But at the same time, we believe that uh, the sharing economy could very fast and very uh, effectively adopt this solution and something like the flying Uber uh, could be the right solution uh, for the mass audience. Well, you, we were talking about flying Uber, which is a really exciting idea. Today, the airmobile can uh, carry two passengers. Um, any plans for a model that will carry four or six, like a flying minivan? No, no. I think the minivan uh, and the bus, it, it already exists. It's uh, current airplanes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, but uh, of course, uh, we have in our pipeline and uh, our design department is working also on some other solutions. But uh, we need to start, so the whole team now is fully focused on the current prototype. And our first product will be two-seater, as we call it, flying roadster. But, uh, of course, it's just the start, and we believe that we will be able to deliver to the market also the different uh, uh, solutions and different uh, setups. So when will you be going into full production? What's your estimate at this point? Uh, of course, there are uh, two, uh, two ways which we need to solve. Uh, the first one is technological, uh, to build uh, the product uh, which will be fully functional, uh, safe, and, and uh, efficient. And at the same time, we need to pass uh, all the certification. And in our case, it's not just one. We need to pass both uh, airplane and, and uh, car certification, which will take some time. 
but uh, of course uh, we try to deliver it as soon as possible and in our plans we start to commercialize our mobile in 2017. It is a giant step for a company to move from prototype to commercial production, and never mind getting through the regulatory processes uh, as well. And uh, many startups really stumble in, during that step. Um, how prepared do you feel to, to move into mass production? Absolutely. We, we understand that this will be one of the major steps uh, which we must uh, do and do it right. So uh, it's the reason why we, from the early beginning, we are trying to have a very open discussion with regulators. Uh, as we are a European company, we started here, so we are talking uh, mostly currently with uh, EASA, which is an equivalent of FAA here in Europe, and also uh, we're working with uh, uh, policy makers and, and certification authorities uh, uh, for the cars. Uh, we build the first product that it fits to the current uh, existing uh, uh, regulatory, so we don't need to wait for the new one, which maybe in the future will be created, uh, especially for the flying cars. So we are aiming to the existing uh, legislation for both cars and planes. And uh, of course, we are building the world-class team. Uh, a few months ago, we were just a very small uh, local team, and I'm very happy that uh, uh, with the investment, the new one which came to the country recently, we are able to hire the best uh, possible people uh, and we are working uh, with the world class advisors, some of them also from US and uh, from other countries, very experienced people like uh, uh, Anthony Sarif, uh, who was uh, the managing director for 10 years and who built from the scratch uh, uh, McLaren. Uh, some, some other guys uh, which are really helping us uh, to find the best combination of both technology and certification. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to unfortunately take our last break, yeah. but stay right where you are. We'll be back after these important messages from our sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and drag and drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. That's Tableau dot com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? We're fortunate to have Scott Caraccioli with us to explain how the process of making sparkling wines influences a winemaker's approach to making a Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Yeah, it's really a driving factor in terms of style and really kind of making it a little bit more old world. Um, we use all French oak, which is the same thing that we use in our sparkling wines. So I would imagine that someone who's not making sparkling wines will take a totally different approach. Yeah, it's a matter of viewpoint when it comes down to when you have a French winemaker making bubbles, you end up with a leaner, more European style of wine. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I, -C -C Cellars, where you have to spell it to drink it. Imagine a medical system that offers the range of care you want with the electronic communication you need. Physicians Medical Group of Santa Cruz is that care provider. With hundreds of independent doctors sharing information with each other, labs, hospitals, and pharmacies electronically, your PMG physician is looking at real-time data about your real-time care needs. 
Visit pmgscc.com. This is Jacques Delacroix, formerly of Facts Matter. Do you remember me? And I'm speaking on behalf of Shirt Crafter of Santa Cruz. If you need business cards, bumper stickers, announcements for social events, T-shirts, printed or embroidered, caps, or other garments with your logo, call Shirt Crafter at 831-423-0537. If you already have a design, it will be reliably executed by Shirt Crafter. If you don't have one, Shirt Crafter's art department will help you develop a good one. Just call Shirt Crafter at 423-0537. I repeat, 423-0537. Or contact them online at www.shirtcrafter.com. Would I make this up? This is Steph. This is Rob. Join us for Out in Santa Cruz Saturdays at 7 p.m. as we bring you the hottest LGBT topics and guests of the week. It's fun, it's fabulous, and we don't shy away from controversy. Visit OutInSantaCruz.com for past shows and more. And follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Remember, join us on Out in Santa Cruz at 7 p.m. Saturdays on KSCO AM 1080. I'm Steph. I'm Rob. And And you've you've been been queered. queered. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and our guest today is the CEO of Aeromobile, Mr. Uri Vakulik. Now, I read somewhere that uh, you're thinking of introducing the flying car in countries which are not quite as burdened by government regulations, countries such as Australia, Brazil, uh, the Middle East. So as one of the most regulated countries in the world, it sounds like uh, it's going to be a while before you'll be offering the product in the United States. Is that right? Uh, Of course, when we are talking about these countries, uh, we use them as an example of the countries when this solution, transportation solution, will work perfectly because it's big countries enough uh, like Brazil, Australia, and we believe that they will be able to adopt it uh, uh, quite early. Uh, As for regulation, of course, as Slovakia is part of the European Union, uh, we need uh, to certify it uh, for the whole EU, and uh, this certification is not easy, of course, and we don't want to uh, go some uh, sideways, uh, so we fully respecting uh, the existing regulatory, and uh, we try to build uh, the product that uh, it will respect uh, all the current legislation, and if we will be able to pass uh, European uh, legislation and certification, we do believe that, uh, again, uh, we need to start it again in the U.S., that we will be able to uh, to pass it and to certify it, our product also for U.S. Now, this is a little bit off topic, but in your view, is the bureaucracy to get a flying plane uh, turning out to be as much work as making the plane itself? I, I think you once said you're tackling 100 years of bureaucracy for the air and another 100 years of bureaucracy for the road. Yeah, of course, uh, because, you know, each new uh, innovation, uh, it's uh, somehow uh, passing uh, or it's not fully respecting the current uh, legislation. Uh, if uh, innovators will just respect uh, the regulation, they will be not able uh, to build something new, but uh, to deliver it to the real market, of course, uh, we need uh, to find a way how to certify our products. But uh, we believe that, uh, like with plenty of innovations in the past, uh, when uh, the certification authority will realize the potential of uh, the new innovation, they will recreate or open new, ca- new categories. But uh, knowing this, uh, our business strategy is that we are building the first prototype uh, uh, respecting the current legislation and current certification categories, and we believe that then uh, in the future new categories of flying cars will be created. Well, I will tell you from my perspective, it is going to be one of the true litmus tests of how serious countries are about innovation. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it truly is. It, when you bring something this revolutionary into a country, it's either going to figure out 
how to create new regulations for a new category, or it's going to try to shove that innovation into existing categories, which will take uh, a lifetime. So uh, I, I think this is going to turn out to be a major litmus test. Now, I would imagine when selecting the locations that you'll first introduce the product, um, if your primary markets are urban commuters and locations where roads and airports and other infrastructure are not built out, countries like Australia look pretty good. Yeah, sure, that uh, also a lot of innovations which uh, uh, all the different companies uh, start to go to the market. Sometimes they started and the first uh, testing markets are not uh, EU or US, uh, some other countries. Uh, but uh, we try to build... Uh, our company, our project, our product is a global one. Uh, so, of course, it will not start exactly the same day uh, globally. We will go uh, market by market, uh, but uh, we are quite ambitious, I have to say, and we will try to do our best uh, to, to be able to certify our product uh, in uh, really the wider scale. Uh, I would imagine that supply chain managers everywhere are watching this technology very closely. Uh, we were talking about as a as a person who travels quite a bit. Uh, no matter how fast my plane goes, I've got that uh, that last couple of miles to get to my location that slows everything down. From you know getting on a bus to getting a rental car to getting in the car, getting a map out, figuring out where I'm going. Um, but uh, from a cargo standpoint, I have to believe that uh, as these early prototypes get larger and more e- fuel efficient and, and more capable, imagine what it does to moving um, goods and merchandise, uh, how it really makes that supply chain so much more efficient. Of course, in the future, a lot of new applications uh, could be created and, and invented for this kind of uh, transportation solutions. But exactly as you said, we believe that door-to-door is really something which uh, we need uh, to solve because I'm using these examples that uh, with technologies we are able to move data in petabytes in nanoseconds, but uh, personal transportation is slower and slower and difficult and difficult, uh, uh, not depending what kind of technology we are able to invent. Uh, so some uh, uh, new innovations must come into the personal transportation, and I believe that uh, uh, the personal transportation is the next big thing, and I'm so happy that a lot of uh, new innovations and inventions are coming to the market, like the uh, Hyperloop, connected cars, uh, uh, drones, uh, and so on and so on. So uh, we believe that uh, this is the new market, uh, new uh, big technological opportunities, and we are so happy that uh, we are doing the same thing. And as you mentioned, the supply chain, I'm very happy that... Uh, uh, even if Slovakia, as we described at the beginning of this show, is not really the big country, but we are in the center of automotive business. Uh, in our country, each year, uh, over one million cars uh, are produced. Uh, Slovakia is the biggest producer of the cars uh, in the globe per capita. So all of my major suppliers are in a range of 200 kilometers. So uh, it makes uh, this project's, uh, project really uh, possible and giving us a lot of opportunities to find the best uh, partners. And again, as we are uh, now more and more known globally, we are uh, in a situation that we are able to talk to the best uh, possible technological partners, suppliers, uh, companies uh, to work with, and uh, this really speed up uh, this project. Uh, pretty impressive compared to, let's say, three years ago. Yes, well... Unfortunately, we're almost out of time. Uh, do you have a website where listeners today can go to see the product and learn more about its specs and performance? Yes, absolutely. I would like to invite all your listeners to visit our website, which is uh, www.aeromobile.com. That's aeromobile.com. And if you'd like to see the video of the newest prototype, you can go to RebeccaCosta.com, and we have the video posted right there on the home page. That is all the time that we've got today. But before we say goodbye, I'd like to thank you for making time to speak to us today. Thank you, Mr. Fakulik. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. If your station is leaving us after the first hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Uri Vakulik, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you missed the full interview with Mr. Vakulik or any of our other guests, you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our YouTube channel and website. 
This week, our website features the dramatic video of the Airmobile flying car. And the reason I asked our web team to do that is because it's one of those inventions that you have to see in action before you can really appreciate just how close we are to flying to work. So take a moment to go to RebeccaCosta.com to see the video for yourself. The website is easy to remember. It's myname.com. I, I still don't know how we managed to get that web address because how often can you get your name.com? <laughs> Not too often. Uh, and while you're at the website, make sure you order your copy of The Watchman's Rattle, one of the best reads of this summer. Not only do 100% of the proceeds go toward keeping interviews like the one you heard today with Airmobile on the air, once you get started, this is a book you will find hard to put down. Just take a look at what Richard Branson and others have had to say about the Watchman's Rattle on our website. Or read any one of the over 100 book reviews posted on Amazon. You're going to want to get your copy of the Watchman's Rattle before my second book hits bookstores this fall. So do it now. Go to RebeccaCosta.com. Only takes a couple of minutes. And with Father's Day right around the corner... What better gift could you give than a first edition book autographed by the author? And by the way, we'll put a custom autograph in there. You just tell us what you want inside the inside cover of the book, and we'll be happy to oblige because I have a dad, and uh, our dads deserve something a little special this this year. My guest next week is legendary publisher and First Amendment advocate Larry Flint who recently challenged the state of Missouri for access to death sentence execution protocols. What is Mr. Flint up to? Don't miss the always controversial Larry Flint next week on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for another hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. (laughs) 